one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be BQ, King of the Mountain Podcast. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in this week. If this is your first time listening to the show, extra special welcome to you. Go ahead and uh, subscribe here if you're listening on YouTube or iTunes, Podbean, SoundCloud, whatever the platform is. I would really appreciate your subscription. Especially here on YouTube, I just uploaded a bunch of brand new content, or I've been uploading a bunch of new content every few days. So sometimes I'll do something what's called BQ Speaks, and it's just a, a vlog that I'm speaking on, or it, I'll you know do some breaking news, or uh, talk about Meltzer and fake news, or whatever. So I've been adding a lot of new content, and uh, I've actually added about uh, 70, 80 subscribers in the last couple days alone. So I really appreciate that. So I really appreciate um, any subscri- any subscription you want to give me right now. So the listenership on the last show was the uh, highest one I've had since I've come back from the hiatus. Now the first episode back from my hiatus, my listenership was probably cut down about 70% from uh, this time last year. So I was pretty worried, you know, three months is a long time to take off from a podcast, but we're starting to climb up a little bit. The YouTube numbers were really nice this time around. And uh, just unfortunately, the SoundCloud and Podbean ones were complete shit this last week, but it's all good. Uh, Podcast is growing and uh, I appreciate everyone, especially the YouTube subscribers who leave comments and feedback and constructive criticism. So big shout out to you guys for participating each and every week. Shouts out to the TNA heel cast. I guess she's not the TNA heel cast anymore, but the heel cast shouts out to impact heads, radio, Robert does wrestling booking the territory podcast, Andre Corbeil impact aftershock. And if I'm missing anybody else, uh, just shoot me a DM. What I'm going to start doing when I hit my 500th subscriber is I'm going to start highlighting a podcast each week. So I'm going to upload somebody's podcast to my channel and put all your links in the subscription, or not the subscription, but in the description. And hopefully we can uh, help each other out and hopefully I can bring some new listeners to whatever it is that you are doing. So this week, my co-host, my man Terrence. Now, before I introduce Terrence, this is not Terrence from Southeast from a couple weeks ago. Now, the funny thing is these two have the same exact name, (laughs) same spelling, and the same last name. (laughs) <laughs> and the funny thing is, I didn't. I had you guys confused for probably like two months on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> so I, I'd be talking to one of you, but I thought you were like the same person. I, I was, and yeah. then one day I, I got like two notifications in a row. I was like, "Oh my god, these are two different people." <laughs> so, uh, so, so what's going on with you, Terrence, man? Oh man, nothing much, man. Nothing much. Had a really, uh, I was kind of telling you earlier, had a really action-packed day, man. Just running around with, with my with my, my daughter, my little stink butt. Um, and, yeah, man, I mean, it's really looking forward to it. It's an honor to be on the King of the Mountain podcast. Um, I'm pretty sure by far you're the most popular podcast that focused uh, specifically on GFW. See, you know what? And I just want to applaud myself because – that GFW just came out naturally. See, I almost said Impact. I, I'm, I've gotten out of saying TNA for a long time, but the GFW just rolled right off. And so I am, I'm, I'm making progress here. That, okay? that was nice. I felt it coming. I felt, I felt uh, TNA or Impact coming. I was like, here it comes, <laughs> here it comes, boom. But you yeah. delivered. Yeah, man. Um, so, so yeah, man. Like, so it's it's an honor to be on, man. Um, I definitely want to just, uh, you know, have fun. And by the way. So Terrence Williams is not that uncommon of a name. So I'm not shocked that there's, you know, people on Twitter who have the exact same name, even the exact same spelling. Because when I was in high school, there were like three or four kids named Terrence, like in my class. So it's not that uncommon of a name. Um, I, I recently came across a Terrence Williams who's like a comedian. And he's like a uh, like a conservative comedian, and he's like the most outlandish dude ever. And I'm I'm looking at this guy, and I'm like, yo, man, if his name could just be anything else. <laughs> like, <laughs> Do you remember? Uh, I just gotta make sure I don't have you both on the same show, or then I'll be really confused. Do you remember there was a Terrence Williams who um, played in the NBA for the New Jersey Nets for a little while? I don't, <laughs> but. The Terrence Williams that plays for the Dallas Cowboys, I get his notifications on LinkedIn all the time. <laughs> so, nice. Do you ever respond like you're him? 
No, I don't. But I, but like people who know me, they respond and like, you know, jokingly laughing. They're like, see that, you know, people obviously are getting some sort of confusion there. So that's always funny. But if I'm ever in Dallas and somebody wants to offer me a free meal, you know, I'm all for it. So, yeah, I'll be Terrence Williams on that day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about first of all, I appreciate the um, what you said about the show and everything. Much, much appreciated. I definitely try to do a good job here. Uh, talked about your show a little bit, your podcast. Um, so <clears throat> my podcast is talking about wrestling. That's T A L K I N B O U T wrestling. Um, you can find it on iTunes or on SoundCloud, or if you just follow me on Twitter at T W talking about that's T W T A L K I N B O U T. Uh, I'll tweet out the link to it every, every week. It usually drops on Sundays or maybe sometimes Saturdays, depending on how soon I get it done. But on my show, you know, we cover WWE, we cover Impact, we cover, you know, even sometimes some stuff outside of uh, of, of of those two. Those are really like the major two that we really cover. Um, what makes my show unique is I try to, you know, get away from reviews, right? Because I feel like reviews are something that you can get on almost every show. And so, like, I, I don't sit down and talk about, hey, this happened on Raw. And this happened on SmackDown. And this happened on 205 Live, right? Instead, I, I like to talk about what really stood out. Um, I don't get too into, you know, rumors because I've never really been a quote-unquote dirt sheet guy. Um, and I also don't think I know it all. Um, I, I don't think I know it all. But I do work in television production. So there are some things in terms of the way shows are put together and the way stories are put together that I may have a bit of an interesting eye for that I love to, you know, point out and talk through with the audience. Um, you know, um, anytime you're listening to someone talk, I think it's always fair to ask, you know, why are we listening to you? Like, what makes <laughs> what makes this person's opinion relevant? And at the end of the day, everybody, no matter who they are, it's just their opinion. But, you know, some people have things that make their experience a little unique that helps shape that opinion, that helps you listen to it. Um, and from, from my perspective, I think one of the things that makes me a little bit unique is I grew up in rural North Carolina, right? And uh, Ric Flair could have had dinner at my grandma's house any night of the week. Like, uh, I, when I was a kid, I'm not sure I even know who the mayor of our town was, but I knew who Ric Flair was. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was, <laughs> it was real like that. And and WWF was always the other thing, right? So the we exist right now in uh, an environment where most of the fans have a complete you know, blind brand loyalty to WWE. And I mean, I guess that's okay, but I just don't see it that way. It's always weird to me, right? So um, I'm not like a blind WWE loyalty, loyal, loyalist. Um, I also, I'm not like a WWE hater, right? Like it's not like, oh, I'm against WWE. I think I, 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 I put things in a reasonably objective perspective and yeah, I mean, but at the end of the day, this is all fun. Um, wrestling is my favorite TV show. Like I'm sure it's yours and anyone who's listening, I'm sure it's your TV show, favorite TV show too. And if you want to listen to, you know, people talk about wrestling that are wrestling fans just like you and are not angling for a job with WWE, then our show might be something that you like. You hit some good things on the head there for all the aspiring podcasters out there. You know, what, what makes your show unique and what makes you qualify to talk about wrestling so it's like me what makes me qualify to talk about wrestling i'm not in the industry but you know like you have a background and i have a background so with me i go to school for business i go to school for marketing i study marketing for fun i always have and so because i understand that mindset i understand um how successful companies operate how companies have failed i understand speaking to a target audience and demographic and so there's certain things that from my outside experiences, I feel qualify me to talk about a wrestling show. So that's really uh, cool to hear. And I'm, I'm happy to have you on here because you do a really good job with your podcast. And I've been um, looking forward to having you on here. I was listening to it one day. I think it was, I mean, I think it was a couple months ago and, and I was like, Oh my God, this guy's good. So um, <laughs> I think I sent you a message uh, or you had already sent me a message on Twitter, but I, I think I sent yeah. you another one later on Facebook or something. It's like, yeah, we gotta, we gotta yeah, have yeah. you on man. So, um, 
Yeah. As wrestling fans, you know, so a lot. Of, some of us can be a bit extreme. You know, some of us can be a bit extreme, and um, and the, the extreme people are fine, right? Because those are the people that are gonna really, you know, make up your audience. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I try to I try to be as balanced as possible. Try to be as fair as possible. You know, like you don't want to go. Like I listen to some people. Um, you know, some some podcasts whose name I will not just go ahead and throw out here, but some podcasts I listen to and I'm like, why do they even talk about this show? It's like it just sounds like they hate it. And like so it's it's just so tough to find somebody who who talks about impact wrestling or whatever, talks about the show and doesn't like sound like they're just turning up their nose at the show. And I heard so much of that on so many different shows that that was one of the big things that inspired me to start my podcast. And I was listening to you talk, and you kind of said something similar. It's like, you know, the, a big reason why why I listen to wrestling podcasts is because I want to have my 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 fire fueled. Like, I want my excitement and and my interest in the upcoming week's show. I want that to be uh, nurtured and 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 make me more excited. For the weeks when the show's coming up. I don't want to turn on a show just to hear how awful it is and how can anybody possibly watch this show. Um, because in all honesty, any bad thing you can say about one wrestling company, you can say about another wrestling company, right? The only thing that WWE is immune to is they have by far the best production value of any wrestling company or, uh, or anyone who does wrestling. Other than that, they've done crappy stories. They've had crappy matches. Like they've they've done really bad, awful segments. So there's nothing bad you can say about one company that you can't say about all the other companies. So I just there there has been this climate of turning up your nose at this particular company, and it just doesn't make sense to me, right? Like I, I'm like, do you, does you think that makes you cool? Like it makes you like one of the cool kids because you know you kick the fat kid with the glasses. Like does that make you cool? No. It just makes you a bully, right? So I don't know. But so, yeah, I, I think people should be able to, you know, listen to a show about uh, impact and, you know, listen to people talk about the news and not have them be slantedly biased for it or against it. But just, you know, an honest conversation about the product. And and I felt like that was really lacking in a lot of people's coverage of the show. Uh, a lot of people never seem to be able to talk about, you know, impact or TNA without delving into the business woes and um for me i was just like well why do you have to talk about that it's just like we get it right but you, it just people just could not seem to talk about it without bringing up the bad business stuff and so um yeah and so i felt like there was definitely a need for someone who wasn't doing that kind of stuff so you know <laughs> the, the reason i started this show and I'm, i guess i'm um previewing a, a future vlog here a little bit early um I was going to be doing a vlog here soon on exactly why I started the show, but it kind of in a nutshell, uh, I've always, I was a, a casual fan of the company for a very long time. And when they went on destination America, I completely lost touch because, uh, up till recently when I started the show, I never got on the internet for wrestling. Like I didn't go on spoiler pages. I didn't even know they existed to be honest with you. I was that, uh, out of tune when it comes to that stuff, but I didn't, you know, I just knew that I DVR'd wrestling every week and watched it. I didn't go on spoilers. I didn't. I didn't read the drama. Like, there's so much about yeah. like the TNA history and the Dixie Carter stuff yeah. that I I I'm learning about now. But at the time that it happened, I I had no clue because I was never in tune to to drama like that. Right. And so they were on Destination America, and I I didn't watch it at all. I mean, I, I had no way of following it, and um. It wasn't until I think I met my wife and she had Destination Destination America, but then that was the end of their TV contracts. So I was like, ah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but I ordered Bound for Glory 2015, mm. I guess it was, and and at this time I was like a level playing field wrestling fan. I watched I watched yeah. everything, uh, uh, not so much now. I mean, I really this is all I watch, but I was level level playing field, and I thought Bound for Glory was like the greatest pay per view. Not the greatest paper. I'm not putting it like oh, it's up there with WrestleMania three or whatever. But I mean, in that era of you know watching WWE pay per views every month or whatever it was, like I I saw that Bound for Glory. I was like, this 
pay-per-view is great. Like they had this great storytelling of uh, Kurt Angle wasn't going to be able to wrestle, but because uh, due to injury, but Eric Young like attacked him anyway, and it almost felt real. And then they uh-huh. still had the match, and there was just I really enjoyed it. What was the main event of that show? That was um, when Matt Hardy won the world title from EC3. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. With, when uh, Jeff was the referee and is a triple threat with, threat with Galloway, so. But I absolutely love the show. And then a week later, I was like, ah, I'm going to read some reviews. Because like I said, I never do that. Or at that time, I didn't. And I had read reviews about how bad that show was. And I was like, I, I was genuinely like, what? Right. You know, because here I am a level playing field wrestling fan. I was like, this is better than the last few WWE pay-per-views I watched. Like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And that's when I, I really started becoming in tune how people, the negative people were. And. You know, I wanted to have that podcast where it's like, it's cool to be a fan of this company. Like we, we need someone to get, you know, you know, it's, uh, we need someone to get excited about it and deliver it. Like some of these podcasters do from other companies like, Oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Like <laughs> I felt like the fans of this product needed that too. So, yeah, you know, oh, man. yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, exactly like, you know, same, same page there in the nutshell. And you mentioned about the slam anniversary 2015. I actually did not watch that show, but Bound for, I watched glory. Bound for glory. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, Bound for Glory. But I watched the Slam anniversary that was a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, "Yo, this show was excellent. This show was really good. Like, there was not. I'm, I'm thinking right now, there was nothing on that show that I didn't like. And it, not only that, but it completely over delivered. Like the tag team match that I wasn't expecting anything from um, was excellent. The JB and Josh Matthews match, like I was dreading that. I was openly hating on that from the second they started that angle. And it was that was one of the highlights of the show. Uh the main event was probably a little blah, but but it was still like it was still a um it it had the prestige it deserved, right? Mm-hmm. For the moment that it was. And um I'm gonna come back to, to this in a second, but um the the podcast, right? So I was I was excited to listen to the podcast uh, circuit that week because I was like, okay, there's nothing they can say about this, right? <laughs> there's no, no way, right? Crazy, no, no, no crappy matches. Like they were, you know, the the worst thing you could say is that the main event wasn't like. A, you know, a, a fantastic match. It was okay. It was just, it was just a match, right? But that's the worst thing you could probably say about it. But it was like every show was like either just ignoring it, just like not even talking about it, or you know, I heard some reviews and it was like it was man. And I'm like, yo, man, like this is ridiculous. Now, again, 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 it does nobody any favors to say something is good when it's not. Right. Like there's Mm -hmm. there's a particular podcast that I listen to that the guy who hosts it just makes me want to vomit with how how he can take anything that happens on WWE TV and try to turn it into a positive. Sam Roberts. Well, I wasn't going to say it. Like Sam Roberts. He's like the LeVar Ball segment was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. Oh, my God, man. Like, I, I mean. Some of this stuff is just like, it's like, come on, dude. Like, you can, it's like, okay, it's like this, right? Like, I have conversations with with people who who are very conservative with their viewpoints, and I feel like I'm kind of in the middle. Some people might think I'm liberal. It doesn't matter, whatever. But the point is, like, when I I watch, uh, like, Fox News, right, I'm like, okay, it's clear they're taking a particular side here, right? And it's clear some other networks are taking a particular side here. But for for like for the for for the entire time our last president was in office, everything on Fox News was an objection to everything this president did. And I was I was talking to one of my friends one time and he was like, you know, if you if you just disagree with everything, like you, nobody's wrong all the time, right? Like you can't like that you you, you can't say, you lose your credibility yeah. if you say somebody's right all the time or if you say somebody's wrong all the time because nobody is right or wrong all the time except you, you're yeah. right all the time. <laughs> Other than that, everybody else 
is they have flaws. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'm a Fox News guy, but I I do understand what you're saying. You can't the narrative cannot be you know all the way to the left, all the way to the right, and that's not I'm not right. talking politically necessarily, but it cannot be all the way to the left, all the way to the right all the time. Like. It's got to be something in the middle. I, I did notice with Slammiversary was a lot of people ignoring how good it was. Um, I read in uh, Dave Meltzer's review of it yesterday. <laughs> what a joke. He yeah. he tore up almost the entire thing. And he, uh, like, you know, he was saying like, oh, the uh, knockouts finish. How That was some old school wrestling stuff. Like, aren't you, isn't this motherfucker a fan of old school wrestling? Like, and he was I trying know. to say, oh, that's some old school shit. Oh. But, um. He he tore this down, you know. He said apparently the this slam anniversary had triple the the buys of last year's, okay. you know. You know, so he takes that positive. He goes, but last year's probably didn't do anything. So that that's <laughs> not just you know what I'm saying. Like he put that kind of spin on on everything. Right, um, right, right. He gave the Full Metal Mayhem a one star. Which there's some people who have told me they didn't like that match. That was actually my favorite match of the whole thing. Um, I think I was so fascinated with the women being involved in it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if you're going to sit here and, oh, this women money in the bank shit, and apparently that wasn't even a good match. I didn't watch it. Or at least yeah. the second one wasn't good. Like, you can't yeah. have that kind of fascination. And then you got two women in a much more brutal match on this side. And, oh, that was a one-star match. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. now, yeah, that's tough. I was, I was really worried about that match um, because, you know, Alicia Edwards is so tiny, man. She's so Oh, my God, tiny. yeah. Like, and, and Angelina Love, by the way, She's excellent. Like she's so good. I <laughs> know she. I, I don't know if she's like uh, you know not really in the swing of being back to the full time with wrestling, but um, I don't see any good reason why she's not in the mix for uh, for a top story on the knockout side because she's so good. She's so good. Like she's as bad as Velvet Sky was as a wrestler. Angelina <laughs> Love is that good. Right, like yeah. Angelina Love's a really good wrestler. So yeah, I, I don't know why she's not getting. Well, I mean, I, I get it. They were doing the uh, Alicia and Eddie storyline, but some of these women that they've been rolling out there, um, yeah, no. So uh, Angelina Love, she could get, she could stand to get get um, a little more camera time with her matches. She she's so good that she. So when the Wolves broke up, I was like, my concern was that Davey was going to be the fan favorite over Eddie, okay. even though he was the heel. Uh, and mm. I had a, I think it was a very genuine concern because Eddie had the title run. A lot of people didn't really care for it. You know, he's right. one of my favorite wrestlers, so I, I was happy about it. But I was actually there when he won it. Oh, yeah? I've been there. I was, oh, my God. I was there. I have a knack for being there for all the major title changes. I was there when Eddie won. <laughs> I was there when El Patron won the first time, even though it got overturned. Oh, I was wow. there when Galloway cashed in. Um, mm. I was there when Bobby Lashley choked out. Uh, that was a slam anniversary. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. what was it Sienna's knock knockout title win? Like nice. I, I've been I've been there for a lot of these. So um, now I don't even remember what I was getting at. So now was what I was saying was I thought Davy was oh, going to be the, the, uh, Eddie yeah, and Dave. I thought he was going to be the popular one, but she was yeah. so good that she is she her element added to Davy Richards yeah. was able to get him. Um, he gets heel heat when he goes out there. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. he he easily could have gone out there because I hate. One of my things I hate in wrestling are cool heels. Yeah. Um, I, th I think I, I do like Kevin Owens, but I think he's a really good example of it. Like he goes out there, wrestles for the pop. Um, and he's so good and he's so witty at what he does that it's like, you can't really hate the guy. So yeah. I, I don't really, I'm not, I like him, but I'm saying for the sake of pro wrestling, I'm not into cool heels. Yeah. And I really thought that's what he was going to be. And, and uh, See, that's interesting. See, I, I don't, I don't necessarily see him that way because I remember now I, I've been watching wrestling for a long time, man. And so when somebody, you know, really makes an impression, it, it stands out. And I will never forget the first time I saw Kevin Owens. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't watch ring of honor. I've never been, I've never been like a ring of honor guy. I've watched it. I watched it for a few, a few weeks when they were on destination America and that is the extent. I saw a few things that I like, but I wasn't really, you know, I could take it or leave it. Um, so, uh, so I had heard of Einstein, but I wasn't really like, you know, I wasn't necessarily like into him, right? But so I, I just happened to be watching. Uh, it was the, it was an NXT special. The you know the first match this guy has when he comes out, right? He has a match with this guy. This dude headbutts him in the face. He's got blood trickling down his nose. 
And, you know, the matches is great. And so it's just like, I'm, it stood out. This moment stood out to me. And as you can see, I'm vividly, you know, remembering the, the first time I saw this guy. And I'm like, yo, this guy's a superstar. Like, you know it when you see it. And so I was sold. I was sold on him, like, you know, for the first time I saw him. And obviously, he came back out later in the show and, and killed Sami Zayn after he won the title. And so, um, but yeah, man, like, Kevin Owens, um, he has this great, first of all, he's fat. Uh, well, he's not, you know, he he, he he looks fat compared to, you know, the, the bodybuilder mold that they like on, on WWE. Um, so he looks like a fat guy. But he what he really looks like, is he looks like the guy that, you know, you have an argument with over parking space and he kicks your ass, right? Like, that's who he, he yeah. looks like a regular guy that you would, you know, bump into in real life and it's just a bad day, right? The neighborhood and, bully, yeah. Right, and, and I love that. That's the quality I love about him, you know what I mean? I love, because in contrast to a guy like The Miz, who is like, listen, if I was at, if I was at a bar and The Miz touched my wife's butt, I'd be like, baby, you can handle that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> take care of that. Not, like, take care of that for me. Feel, I don't feel like he's a threatening person, right? Like that's 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 always been my biggest knock on the Miz. And Kevin Owens is like the complete opposite of that, right? And so it's, he had that element of realness that I always kind of connected with. And so um, yeah, I don't know. I, I never really got like the quote unquote like cool factor from him, uh, just because I mean. I, I'm not in tune to the uh, the ROH crowd, right? Like I I tune a lot of those guys no, out. Right? Me too. The same people who are who are take every possible storyline and try to imagine that it's a way to get the Bullet Club back together in WWE, and I just laugh. <laughs> I laugh so hard. Where everyone thought there was going to be a Balor Club, I was like, dude, that was a T-shirt. Yeah. God. <laughs> like, um, yeah. So we're going to get an impact here shortly, but uh, update. I know I've uh, been talking for a little while that Ali was going to come on the show. We're still <laughs> working on a um, uh, time and date for that, but I'm hoping it's going to be this month. So uh, once I get Ali on, because she's um, the priority right now, uh, she's the first person I had semi-scheduled. So once once we get her on and uh, we get that interview knocked out, have an interview coming up with Sienna, uh, one with the CEO from Future Legend, and um, William Week, so he was the enhancement talent that uh, that has been on Impact a couple times. He awesome. had the match with Congo <laughs> Kong, and then last week, uh, who was it? Last week he was against. Uh, oh, uh, he, uh, Trevor Lee. Trevor Lee, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so he's gonna be coming on. He he actually listened to the podcast last week and uh, shouted me out on Twitter because I said some good things about him, and I wish I said more good about him because I actually <laughs> was talking with my brother. I was like, this guy's facial expressions are money. You know, just the way he's so serious and everything. And um, so, yeah, he's definitely – he'll be coming on soon. So got uh, got some good stuff coming up. Um, I wanted to plug Sienna's Patreon group. Once again, I try to do this every show. And if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's basically a fan club. You shoot a couple bucks a month, and there's different tiers. So you can do as little as a dollar and be involved in our Facebook group. I say ours because it's a little community, but it's Sienna's uh, – private Facebook group and it's really cool because she does she is in there and she talks to you and so all you people on Twitter that trying to get people's attention and get mad because they don't respond like she is actually in there talking with us and it's a lot of fun so I do uh I pay I pay ten dollars a month so I, I get the blog that she does and she's made it very clear we do not share her blog or um share her content but um she said we can you know share excerpts from this, And the reason I, I kind of want to read a little bit about this one here is because this is a topic that I know all the Global Force fans, it was something that drives them nuts as fans. And once I saw the title of this blog, I was at work. I was falling asleep because I worked the night shift. All of a sudden, I, uh, I was like, oh, my God. I start reading this, and um, I had a customer I do security and everything. I had a customer just waiting outside the gate for me, but I was just reading Sienna's blog. So, <laughs> um, so the blog is titled, will you please come to WWE? So that's something that, you know, we see as fans all the time where they, uh, where people will get on Twitter and, and, you know, you always see the trolls. there, like, come to WWE, come, come this and this. So it's a really good article about, you know, it starts off saying TNA, Impact, GFW, the company that hired me at my heaviest and never said shit to me about it. 
Um, so she starts off kind of like giving the company props and everything, uh, thanking them for letting her get on the mic and do what she's got to do for her being able to be free on Twitter and everything. Um, she talks about how upset she gets when people don't view the promotion as, you know, a legitimate promotion or take them seriously. She had, she actually went out of her way here to say that she has always been paid on time since she's been a part of the company. She talks about they ha them having a dream schedule within the company and you know that they that when they're not working the tapings they can go out and work indies and make money off their own merchandise and and all that so th this part I, I liked here uh i'm gonna read a, a little bit of it where she says i'm not knocking wwe but i'm happy where i'm at i'm respected and i'm not lost in the sea of everyone and their grandmother i do believe i would excel in the wwe i'm not just a big fish in a little pond but i'm having fun where I am. It pisses me off that the slander and the past have skewed the fans and promoters vision alike to the point where some of them don't see GFW wrestlers as real stars. I am a champion on international television. Go fuck yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how she ended it. <laughs> yeah. That, that's about the midpoint here. And oh, then that's awesome. <laughs> she says, I love when fans come out and say, come to WWE. I want to reply. Okay. On my way. So I wanted to give some, excerpt here because um you know I'm, I'm serious about helping you know doing my part to help her grow that group and everything i love being a part of it and i mean it's only you know god it costs so many people a buck five bucks ten bucks i mean there's different tiers you can just go to her twitter i, I can never spell allison so i'm not going to spell it out but you just go to her twitter and it's the uh in the bio there you just click you know you can join the patreon group and for as little as a buck you can at least get in on the facebook group which is a lot of fun so um, yeah, I was like, uh, I was reading through that Patreon group one day, and I was like, I was curious as to what it was, and there were so many tears. I was, I was, I could not believe. First of all, I know, I believe there are people who subscribe to every level, every every tier of that. There's at least like one person that subscribes to the top tier of that, and some of those things, I'm like, yo, y'all have got to be crazy not because it's her because like she's awesome like you know what i mean if i was somebody who had like endless disposable income i may be interested in something like that but uh, i mean like like this is this is every tear was like and there's just there were so many tears and i was just like yo but i mean but i think it's i think it's really dope i think it's a really dope thing um and uh and i hope it's doing well because she's she's uh pretty great i love what you said uh from there that she talked about you know this company hired her at her heaviest um and i do remember her being you know presented as like you know i'm not gonna say like a beast but like kind of like you know just a, a bigger a bigger girl or whatever and yeah i mean like she's definitely like you know tightened it up like i'm not really in the i'm not into uh objectifying women publicly like i have a daughter so uh, me too, but, yeah I mean, but but I'm a fan of uh you know I think she I think she looks great you know what I mean I think she looks great and uh, and I love her character so um yeah I definitely want to see her um, continue to do well but the whole you know will you come to WWE thing or or are you coming to WWE like yo that stuff annoys me so bad too because it's like in in the eyes of these blind WWE loyalists. Nothing else matters. Nothing else you do anywhere matters. I had this dude tell me one time, and the biggest rabbit hole of an argument you can ever get in online is debating someone who seems unreasonable. It's like if you see somebody who says something that sounds unreasonable and then you engage them, you should know what you're getting into because this person was already unreasonable. I was talking about something, and uh, this guy tried to tell me why OVW counts as wrestling history. Like, the developmental... When OVW was a developmental territory for WWE, he was telling me that that counts as, like, wrestling history. I'm like, dude, like, let me just try to explain this to you, right? It's like, OVW is practice. It's rehearsal for the big play, right? It's like, that, that stuff's like... it. it I'm not gonna say it doesn't count, right? Like, I mean, like, it, it happened in your life if you were there, but, like... It doesn't count, right? Like it's not like a. It wasn't like a real promotion. It was like they're developmental. It was practice. So, oh god. But so yeah, I just don't know why everybody thinks that everyone just needs to be in WWE. If you're in WWE, 
are you going to be, you know, a bigger star than you would be anywhere else? Absolutely. A hundred percent. That's true. But if you like what somebody is doing, wrestling fans, just appreciate what you're seeing. Like, I could not stand for so long how people try to, uh, you know, invalidate Sting's career because he hadn't been in WWE. I was like, kiss my grits, man. Because I was a kid. I grew up. Um, Sting was my guy. Like, Sting was my John Cena. So for anybody to try to tell me that Sting, what, his career wasn't valid until he went to WWE, you could kiss my grits because I just wasn't, you know what I mean? I wasn't trying to hear it. And so, yeah, you can miss me with all that, you know, when are you coming to WWE stuff because, you know, like I said, I just, I think it's stupid and it really, uh, what whether you're trying to do that or not, you're minimizing everything the person is doing now. So cut it out. Right. If where, wherever it is you are, if you accomplish something, if someone is telling you, you are, you are our guy, you are our gal, that is something to be proud of. If you're employee of the week at McDonald's, that's it's something to be proud of because it is an accomplishment. Because wherever you are, if they if you are told, hey, you you have excelled, um, you know, it's something to be proud of. So it's uh, I, I hate that argument too. So this was the longest one of the longest uh, openings I've ever had before uh, getting to Impact here. But uh, let's uh, oh wait one more thing before we get to Impact. I gotta I I I, I gotta ask you. So listen, I know that you have a lot of loyal listeners, but they may not know like your backstory. So give us the cliff notes version, right? Of, you know, at what point you knew that wrestling was like a major thing for you. Like when, when did you like really kind of fall in love with wrestling? All right. Let's, it's like, you're asking the questions now. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, my, my earliest memory, uh, God, I must've been, um, maybe second or third grade to be honest, but I, I kind of got into it funny, oddly enough, watching that Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling, the uh, cartoon. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool because I, I kind of fell in love with the characters, like the real, you know, outlandish characters and everything. And, uh, so I started watching the VHS tapes and all that stuff. And, uh, I, Macho Man was the one I was really into at a young age I didn't like him later when he started wearing the cowboy hat and the baby face stuff. I, I didn't enjoy that. But back when he had the glasses and, you know, the big old, uh, big old sunglasses that took up his entire face and the headband and the, the robe and everything, Miss Elizabeth, like that, that guy really, uh, I connected with that. Like, I, I thought that was the greatest character in the world. And, um, but yeah, oddly enough, that cartoon was what kind of got me really into it as a, at a young age. And then when I got to high school, I actually stopped watching for several years. Believe it or not, I stopped watching during the Attitude Era. What? That, that's when I stopped watching. Um, I think it was I because I you, that was that was the best time. <laughs> and it was. Now that you know, I, I, I look back and I watch some old stuff. I'm like, this this stuff's great, you know. But um, I didn't like the change at the time. I didn't enjoy the changes because it wasn't what I grew up off as a kid, and I and. Um, I didn't like the firework. There's the pyro and the just, I don't, I, I just wasn't connecting with it the same way. So I stopped watching for a while about 2002 and the attitude era was over. <laughs> like when I started watching again and then, uh, you know, I stopped watching, uh, WWE as a whole about a year, uh, a year ago. I think I, extreme rules was the last pay-per-view I watched. And I, I said, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I, I, the pay, the show was so bad. And I, it wasn't that I, I really hate the company or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I'm 37. I have three kids. I oh. go to school full time. I work full time. Um, I was like, I don't got time for this shit. You know, yeah. like this, I'm going to sit here three hours, one day, two hours, the next an hour, another, there's going to be multiple pay-per-view. Like I was just like, dude, I got better shit to do with my time. And that was a lot of the reason that I just, I pulled the plug on it because I just, I just had, I just had better stuff to do with my time than to sit there for three hours and get pissed off by the end of the show. So, um, yeah, yeah, listen, man, a lot of people don't have the guts to make that call. You know what I mean? A lot, you know, don't. Nope. so, so a lot, a lot of somebody, uh, somebody says, uh, I can't remember who said this, but you know, but it's so true is that the, uh, the reason that most of us still watch wrestling is habit and hope. It's a habit 
You know, we just got we've gotten used to making it part of our Monday nights or whatever. And we hope that we're going to see something great. You know what I mean? So habit and hope just keeps people watching. But you're right, though. Like at some point, you you got to look at it and be like, you know, is this worth my time? You know what I mean? And if it's not, then put it down and live your real life. Right. TNA never asked me to drop everything to follow their product. That's that's why I became so loyal over the years. They, they were never like, hey, uh, watch us on Thursday or whatever night it, it's on. But but also we want to take your Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday as well. And um, every other Saturday, yeah, no, you know, fair. like that, that would that they've never asked me to do that. They just said, hey, enjoy our product. You know, it was never it was never asking me to do too much. So um, so I became very loyal to them. But, yeah, there was a period of time where I I stopped which is when wrestling was at its hottest, oddly enough. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right, man. So that was a nice little 45 minute lead in. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Longest, longest intro in the history of the show. So, uh, so yeah, let's get into impact and we'll kind of wrap it, uh, review it fairly quickly so that we don't have, uh, you know, people hanging on here too long and everything. But so it, um, it kicked off with the uh, Super X Cup match is a Sammy Guevara versus Drago. So to put this out there, uh, from what I understand, there was a pretty bad storm during this show. That's why the crowd was a bit thinner and it was much thinner for this opening match. Uh, it feel it started filling in by the second match, but, um, from what I understand, there was a pretty bad storm there and in the impact zone from the parking to walking there, it's pretty close to a 20 minute walk with you know, oh, wow. no, no cover. So, I mean, it, most likely people are pretty, uh, not in the mood to cheer for wrestling, you know, right. but, but, uh, uh, Sammy Guevara versus Drago. Uh, this was great. It, I thought the, um, finish came out of nowhere. It was a little flat for my taste. It just came out, out of nowhere, but Sammy Guevara is very impressive. I was hoping he was going to win this because I was salivating at the idea of him versus, uh, Xavier next week or not next week, but in the, uh, the next round. Um, and that wasn't what happened. So Drago pulled this out. I wasn't expecting it, but what, what'd you think of this match? Um, I, I thought, you know, kind of like you said, I, I thought, uh, you know, Sammy Guevara, he shined despite, despite taking the loss. Um, Drago, uh, he's getting a reputation with me for being a little bit sloppy. Um, you know, he fell off the top rope at Slammiversary. That was, you know, I'm sure that's going to be on Botchamania. Um, and he had a few sloppy spots in this match. Even the finish, the the rolling DDT, that wasn't very clean. And it, it kind of just made me appreciate the magic that they do with him on Lucha Underground um, to kind of really make him look like a great, you know, a great performer. Um, you, you know, you got to accentuate guys' positives. But... Um, yeah, the, the crowd was pretty dead. Uh, you know, the storm, you, you know, I didn't know about the storm, but that definitely explains it. Um, you know, I'm not going out of my way to, yeah, I don't give, I don't really care. Like I'm, I'm not trying to get rained on for a 20 minute walk to see nothing. Um, right. so, um, yeah. So, so yeah, like, um, I thought this, Sammy Guevara did really good. I, the thing that stood out to me about this whole segment though, was the, uh, the pre-match promo segments. Um, I just I thought Sammy Guevara really uh, put his personality across, right? It made me say this is a guy to watch. He's young, he's hungry. Then he comes in the match and he really delivers with, you know, a super athletic style and you know, he's somebody who I'll be keeping an eye out for going forward. So, you know, anytime you can have a segment where you have a clean winner, a clean loser and nobody looks worse for the wear, then I think that's a win. Right, and I, I, I fully expected him to win this match. Uh, it actually really caught me off guard that he uh, when it was over, but he did sell that move pretty well. I mean, he had the whole eyes rolling in the back of the head thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So which he's definitely a blue chipper. Like he's he's um he's pretty special. I'm I, I'm hoping. I think everyone's hoping that he's part of the company full time. I I had said that and tagged him, and he retweeted it. So uh, usually that means one or two things. He's lobbying to be a part of the company um, or he, he really is. And he's just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, retweeting the stuff that's relevant to that. But I think, I do think him and ACH are most likely part of the company. It's just that with this super X cup um, and they're trying something new where they're, they're uh, recognizing independent promotions where these guys come from. I think it's a matter of, 
uh, creating good partnerships with these promotions. And right. from what I'm understanding, they're going to promote the indie programs heavier next year on air. So, you know, say um, Desmond Xavier is going to be at Wrestle Circus, which I think he actually is at the moment, uh, that, you know, they're going to put that out uh, over the air and everything. So that's what I'm understanding is going to happen from, you know, uh, I'll say I kind of got some inside connections, but um, I don't want to put it out there too much. But uh, yeah, so I, I think it's cool. To, to do that and um so we'll get drago and desmond xavier and then ach will take on the winner of richards and ishimori i think it's i think it's pretty safe to say davy richards is going to win that one but uh hmm. i actually think he's going to win this whole thing who do you think is going to win this whole thing uh you know <clears throat> okay so davy richards right i've been saying this this might be a long play to kind of get to what I was been saying for a while, as soon as Davy Richards came back and I started seeing what was going on between him and Eddie Edwards, I said immediately that what they need to do is find some way, somehow, to get the X Division title onto Davy Richards. Because at that point, the X Division title becomes the centerpiece of the most interesting feud in this whole company. And so the history that Davy Richards and Eddie Edwards have, it's not going away, right? The, you know, people talk about the fight for everything and all this other stuff. Like, these guys have had match after match after match after match, and they might fight other people, but if at any given time you see a brawl start happening between Davy Richards and Eddie Edwards, you're going to know why, right? Because the feud is that deep. Mm -hmm. And so you make a great point. It would make perfect sense for Davey Richards to win the Super X Cup, and then he has a claim that, hey, I'm the number one contender for the X Division Championship. You put that X Division title on him, and like I said, you, you now you've got a, a, a super evil heel with your X Division title, and you've got your goody good guy, Mr. AIP, you know, they have a natural built-in rivalry and the title just happens to be there. So all of, a, all of a sudden, you get your X Division title catapulted to the top of the company. He cut a good promo a couple of weeks ago. They asked Davey Richards about the tournament and he had said, um, you know, what, what does this cup mean to you? He's like, ah, you know, I'm not really an X Division guy. I want to be the world champion, but this will do. So <laughs> real real good heel promo. But, I mean, I, I felt like there's a story to be told with that. Um, so we're going to see what oh, happens. But you know what, though? You know uh, what? If 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 this goes that way, right? When are they doing destination? X? They're doing that in August, right? Mm -hmm. Crap. Well, the Super X Cup won't be over by then, will it? Yeah, the finals will be there on that show. So destination X is usually when you have the chance to cash in option option C, right? Oh yeah. So if Davy Richards had the title at that time, then that could could have been something there but i don't know either way i say uh it, i i say get that x division title on him and then you have the x division title in your hottest feud so um however you got to do it by hook or by crook get him get him that title we then get sienna versus amber nova there's been rumblings that amber nova is possibly a part of the company i i know she's kind of gone out of her way to say she wants to be in the WWE. So for me, I don't really want people that say that. Not not that, I mean, it's, it's um, of course, wrestlers join, you know, start wrestling to do so. But I just mean, right now we're in it. We're in an era. We want people who want to be there. And I think those are the people that should be focused on. But uh, this was, you know, basically a squash, ma squash match. This was uh, Ivan Drago versus Apollo Creed. Uh. This was uh, a... <laughs> I was uh, I was almost gonna look for a, a GIF online of that about the knockout, um, but that's pretty much pretty much what this was. And uh, I've pointed this out the last few weeks. Whenever we see these real short matches, there's usually storyline attached to it at the end. Sometimes I wish we would get a competitive match and they would get into a storyline, but usually it's like one or the other. We're getting an actual match or we're getting a quick match and then a uh, growing storyline. So that's what it was this time around. I was happy to see her hit the AK-47. Uh, I do like that move. So now she has the arsenal of the choke, the um, which is a great move too, because in, in the you, MMA world, that is a that is an immediate tap out. So that's a great uh, move for her to use. And then the silencer, obviously. So 
this is a minute and a half. Uh, probably didn't even break a sweat here with Amber Nova. But w- what do you think about when Karen Jarrett comes comes out? Um, there's a lot of people. The minute she comes out, they're like, I I want to change the channel, whatever. There was a promo she cut to open Impact about two months ago, which was one of the you know, uh, if I can be respectful, well, there's no respectful <laughs> way of saying it. it was the it was the worst thing, <laughs> worst opening segment I've. It was you know so after that they've kind of kept her off screen in, in large portions um, because I don't think she she connects with the audience very well, but uh, I do I do like the where, where they're going with it where they got a little feud the two of them. Um, it, is it doing anything for you the whole Sienna Karen Jarrett thing? Uh, okay, um, so <laughs> Karen Jarrett is one of my uh, personal peeves when it comes to this, and I'll come back to her. But let me start with Sienna, aka Mean Bay. Okay, that's what <laughs> uh, listen, uh, Sienna, I'm here for it. Okay, um, holla anyway, <laughs> where we were, uh, I love her getting the squash here, right? Because I, I love the idea of having your champions win in squashes, um, you know, because the champion should be the uh, the centerpiece of that segment, right? So if you're a fan and you're just sitting here, what you need to come away with is that this champion is a big deal and this person in the ring can't really mess with them, right? So, and that's exactly what you got here. I love presenting the champion in that way. Okay, everything that happened after the bell, though, stupid. Uh, I, I like seeing it on the mic. I like that. That wasn't stupid. But, I mean, Allie ran down with a stick. Why? Why? Yeah, I think that's the only weapon they have backstage. That's about the fourth time she's come out with a kendo stick. But, but Allie's she's a good guy. Why would she roll down? She's the sweetheart. Why would she run down with a weapon, right? And she should so, come down with flowers. So, I mean, or for a fair fight, right? You're a baby face. You come out and challenge somebody face-to-face to a fair fight, right? Okay. Oh, no, but Karen Jarrett came in first, right? And Allie came down to save Karen, right? That, that's what happened? Yeah. That's right, because Sienna called out Karen and told Shanice, like, get on her knees. And I was like, oh. And it was like, uh, um, yeah. And then, then everybody, every woman in the company ran out and whatever. But this all started with Karen Jarrett. Now, Ooh. I'm glad you said it, okay? Uh, I, let, let's, let's, let's go with this, okay? Before I go off on a tangent, rather than go off on a tangent, just answer, can you think of a segment that has been made better by Karen Jarrett? No, absolutely not. None, ever, never, not one. She's not good on TV, okay? And the biggest thing, the biggest problem is that... People have with the perception of this company, no matter what you call it, is that it's it's WWE light, right? That, that is, it's knockoff WWE, okay? And they need to do any and everything they can do to not be perceived in that way. And so when people see Karen Jarrett as the boss coming out, giving promos in the ring, what are they going to compare that to? Stephanie McMahon. Okay, and and how good is Stephanie McMahon? She's a great heel. She's excellent. Stephanie McMahon is amazing. She is one of the best on-screen performers in all of wrestling. Okay, Stephanie McMahon is excellent, dude. She uh, Stephanie McMahon came to my job one time to do. Uh, she she's the she's the corporate brand ambassador for WWE. She came to my job one time and she did like a you know the WWE's corporate branding um, you know speech or whatever. And dude, she's just so good, man. She's so sharp. She's so quick. Um, and that, but but on TV, she's excellent, right? And so Karen Jarrett being compared to her, you can't look good being compared to her. And so you drag down the entire look of the company by putting you out there in a role that fair or not is going to be compared to Stephanie McMahon. Okay. And if you're going to be compared to Stephanie McMahon, you better be damn good. You better bring it. Yeah. And you're not. 
Okay, you're not. And I'm not doing this. I'm not trying to insult Karen Jarrett. I'm not trying to insult the Jarretts or anything like that. But I'm just saying as an objective fan who has absorbed many, 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 many years of wrestling, she's not good. She doesn't add anything to the show. She even takes away from the show. So there's just no good reason to have her on TV other than to fuel your egos. I think the um, the the segment that they had where they mentioned those guys, uh, showed them doing the video at Camp Boggy Creek, I think that is the perfect role for Karen Jarrett. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have her out there doing that stuff because I'm sure she's, you know, in person, I'm sure she's like a beautiful woman and, you know, she presents very well. Um, I'm sure she, you know, she would be great in a corporate ambassador type of role. And I think, man... You put her out there and let her promote your brand, promote your company, but she doesn't need to be on TV. She's just, she's not good. She's not, okay? And so the, the my like of this segment went down the second she stepped onto TV. And where is this all going? Is this leading to a Karen Jarrett Sienna match? Right? Like, oh, so no, I doubt that. This, where is this even all going? So, uh, th- they need to find some way to just have Karen Jarrett moonwalk out of this story and just not to be seen from again unless it's a Camp Boggy Creep video. <laughs> if I, in my personal opinion, I think it's leading towards Karen Jarrett eventually uh, bringing someone in to shut Sienna up. Because we know they're going to be adding a lot of new knockouts. Uh, there's at least two or three that are supposed to be coming on board here soon. So I think, I think she's... Um, going to introduce the person who's uh, sh- supposed to shut her up and supposed to stop her. That's where I think it's going with her. You know, first they try to be like, well, I've got Christina Von Erie. She's the champion, you know, and then Sienna rolled right through her. So that's kind of where I think it's going with it. But I- I- I'm so entertained by Sienna and her mic skills that, you know, even when Karen comes out, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me a whole lot. Um, did Gail Kim come out in her bra? Um, maybe not officially, but I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, Gail Kim has, she, she's built very, um, compactly, right? So, yeah. it, so uh, she, she wears small clothes, right? So, I mean, like, the, the uh, it might have looked like a bra, but I'm sure it's, it comes in different sizes and maybe it looks like more of a shirt. Yeah, I was like, what person. the hell is, um. <laughs> but we're not saying don't do that, Gail, in case you're listening. <laughs> she does. She gets a great response from the audience. Um, I, I, I love her. So um, so anyway, I'm going to address a couple of things. First thing with Ali and the uh, kendo stick. I said this a couple of podcasts ago. I think they're leading towards a uh, – I just think they, they probably took in a segment too far because when she came out the kendo stick again, I was like, oh, here we go. Um I, I think they're leading towards like a Singapore cane, cane match or something like that with Laurel, like a, a blow off or their feud or whatever. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Cause usually when they start introducing a weapon and it shows up multiple times, right? Um, like that's how WWE always booked the, uh, extreme rules pay-per-view like ain't no one use a steel chair all year and then all of a sudden someone right. starts coming out of this shit oh now there's a chair match you know this so, is the only way to handle this yeah 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 um but yeah that's where i think it's going uh so we'll see that's just my my guess um we're getting which just should be really good uh sienna versus rosemary and last knockout standing match i have heard this match is excellent so I don't read spoilers, nothing like that. But I, I've heard that this is really, really good. And uh, I'm still waiting for the really good Sienna Rosemary match. Like I feel like it's there. Um, I just I haven't seen it yet. Right? Like we loved. I think we all loved the uh, Rosemary Jade Steel Cage match. Um, that match was really good. So we know that Rosemary has good matches in her. Um, and with Jade being the common thread. You know, Jade has had legendary wars on the indies with Sienna. So, um, you know, just now, unless Jade is just so good that she's just out here making everybody look good, then you should be able to put these two together and get a good match. Um, And I haven't read any of the spoilers about this either. So maybe this could be, you know, the match that we're hoping for between these two. 
I hope so. I think the Slammiversary match was a bit rushed on time. That's my my guess. But um, we go to the uh, LAX clubhouse and they drag in the beaten body of El Hijo, Hijo de Dos Caras. And um, Conan says, you saw what we did, did uh, Crazy Steve. And uh, make sure Patron joins LAX or this is going to happen to you. Um, the Swole Mates are not over. Oh, my God. Yo, <laughs> not over is the nicest way you could possibly put that. I don't ever want to see those guys again. I mean, like, there's no there's no point, right? Like, okay, as good as D'Angelo Williams was, these guys are the opposite. Is, is that fair? That's very fair. Um, no charisma, no nothing. Um, every time I see them, the first thing I think is uh, Mike, Mc, Mike McMahon, who does the PW Torch uh, Impact coverage. He tweeted, there's no way those guys could pass a drug test. And that's, no. that's exactly what I think every time I see those guys. Yeah, shout out to Mike McMahon. Um, these guys, I watch this show. I watch about five minutes of the show. Um, <laughs> what is it? This is one of the worst shows I've ever seen. It's, <laughs> it, it's almost like a uh, kind of a real world reality show um, type of thing and it's almost like following their lives a little bit, but it's, we're not connected to them. You know, like we don't usually when they say, Oh, we're going to do, you know, uh, a reality show about this person. It's usually because they're fairly controversial in the, in the mm-hmm. uh, public eye or whatever. And you have some kind of connection, but it's like with these guys, it's just kind of following them around. And the, and the production is really bad oh. as well. I don't know if it's done it almost looks like it's done purposely that way to give it like an old school sitcom look. I, yeah. I, I feel like they're doing that on purpose to be honest, but I watched about five minutes. Of, I was like, I can't, this is, I can't do this. Do those guys have as little personality on their show as they showed on wrestling? No, nah, they, I would say they, they've got some personality to them. Okay. Um, it's kind of like a comedy show type of thing too. I, I just, uh, man, I wasn't a fan. I didn't really care for it. Um, the uh, We'll get back to the Swole Mates when their actual uh, segment comes up here. But Bruce Pritchard is on the phone. And um, I think with the way most people feel about Karen Jarrett, I feel about, I actually kind of like Karen Jarrett. Um, <laughs> but, but I think she's better served than the roles you were mentioned. Bruce, I don't care for at all. I think he's, um, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Uh, I think he's the worst on-screen character in wrestling, and that, that just you know my opinion. I he, he makes me want to turn the channel. I don't, mm-hmm. but he makes me want to because he comes out very like, hur, hur, you know, screaming and for no reason, and you know now he's got this little goatee, which I guess is supposed to be his heel his heel goatee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he's walking around plugs hit plugs his podcast and his t-shirts and. Right. I think when when Car- when uh, not Karen but Jeff Jarrett initially put some people together where he said okay let's bring in Conan who has a su- successful podcast let's bring in by the way if anyone hears a shout out to me from Conan Conan on his recent podcast please let me know he said he was going to shout me out um, so Conan he had his thing uh, Bruce Pritchard is supposed to have a really popular one I know Vince Russo was <laughs> he had said himself that Jarrett contacted him but russo's uh, listenership wasn't high enough uh. so i know what they were doing i think i think at one point they said oh, okay these podcasts have such a control over the negative or over the, on the narrative right now mm. with this company because they're so negative and people are so many people are listening they're feeding into it i think at that one point they said we're going to change the narrative we're going to get involved with these guys that have you know podcasts with high listenership and try to change the narrative. And from what I understand, Bruce doesn't even a little bit talk about GFW. <laughs> like I, I haven't listened to the show, but from what I understand, is like strictly WWE. Yeah. So he's not helping well, the product had, at all. He had, he had um, there was uh, so what I did was um, like I go into my podcast and I look through like the the catalog, like the archives of of of, of the shows, and I found the TNA episodes. And they were actually pretty good. 
Um, he went into detail about a lot of stuff. Like, I listened to them while I was outside shoveling snow. So if you have, like, uh, you know, two hours to kill, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good listen. Um, he talked a lot about Dixie, a lot of, you know, uh, behind-the-scenes stories, a lot about um, uh, Desmond Wolf, you know, who everybody mm-hmm. loves now, Nigel McGinnis. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of good, uh, kind of funny stories and, um, that stuff was good, but I'm not so, um, I'm not so inclined to really want to know all of the, you know, behind the scenes WWE stories or WWF stories. Like, it's like, he did like a three hour podcast on The Undertaker. I, I don't, why? What are you going to tell? I don't, you know, I mean, like, I don't know. This is, I'm sure it was very popular. A lot of people want to see it, wanted to hear it, but that just did really, didn't really do it for me. So, um, I mean, his podcast is cool, right? I mean, like, if you, you know, it, but again, there's just, there's so much wrestling content out there. It all depends on what you're looking for, right? So, uh, yeah, you know, his, his, his show is popular. Um, but you, you were talking about him as, as an on-screen character, and I totally agree with you. I think Bruce Pritchard's presence on this show is a reflection of the, the fact that they're still kind of figuring out a few things with the structure of GFW from a front office standpoint. And um, I think, you know, one of the first things Jeff Jarrett, Jeff, Jeff Jarrett did once he got the reins of this company, you know, once he got the uh, creative control or whatever, is, is he called up, you know, he called up his buddies. He called up the old crew, the people that were working behind the scenes back when, TNA was considered a hot and rising brand, and he tried to get all people back together. You know, Dutch Mantel famously was the mind behind the knockouts. Um, Bruce Pritchard was like the talent relations guy and somewhat of a consultant on creative. But now, Bruce Pritchard is, is he's just an on-screen guy. Uh, he mentioned on, I think it was Stone Cold Show, that he is somewhat of a consultant. I mean, I guess that means that they'll ask for his input on something from time to time, but he probably is not really into it like that, right? And so um, they started a story with him at uh, Slammiversary with him missing the show. And it, it looks like, like you mentioned, you know, he's got his heel goatee now. So, you know, they're, they're probably on the verge of doing something with him uh, ending ending up off the show, and I'm perfectly fine with that, right? Because again, similar to what I said about Karen Jarrett, he's not adding anything to this show. He's not. The first time he came out, you know, he had his something to wrestle with uh, uh, Titan Tron thing up there, and I mean, I guess that was something. Again, I guess it depends on how influential you think Bruce Pritchard is, right? Um, to me, not so much. So, you know, what he's adding to the show, I don't see it. Fire Bruce. <laughs> so he, I, I, what I'm understanding, they're good, they are going to do a uh, angle here pretty soon between him and Dutch over control of the company or something, something along those lines. Um, but anyway, he was backstage. Trevor Lee came up. We're seeing a lot of personality from Trevor Lee, and it's 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 funny. It's it's um it's not too comical, but it's it's funny. It's entertaining, and he questions why he has the title on. And he said, "Well, you know, all this this and that happened." I didn't really get my rematch. I don't know if that's your fault. So that was cool. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm a better champion than him. So Sanjay comes out and they're restraining Sanjay. They did not restrain the swole mates from coming in the ring twice in the last two weeks. They were, they were good to go. Security let that happen. But Sanjay, who's a employee of the company, apparently cannot enter the impact zone. So not really sure what that's about, um, but I'm, I'm curious to see where they're going with this. So if, if Bruce Pritchard is being annoying in real life with his presence, he's being doubly annoying with his character, right? Like, so Sanjay Dutt, the rightful champion, comes up to him backstage and Bruce has security escort him away as the heel who stole Sanjay's title is standing right there. Like... What is that, right? What is that? That that makes zero less than sense, less than any sense, right? That's so, uh, Bruce, like you know, what are you doing? Seriously, the only answer to that is Bruce Pritchard is a racist, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because if you ask WWE, uh, if you're brown, uh, you your biggest gripe is that everyone is racist against you, right? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so next match, um. 
I enjoyed this match here. This was the six six man tag of uh, Laredo Kid, Garza Jr., and Octagoncito versus Idris Abraham or Idris Abraham. I'm sorry, Trevor Lee and Damos. Um, what I've enjoyed about this minis thing, you know, a lot of people are quick to really write off uh, midgets wrestling. And Conan said they signed El Torito. I I don't. I was just thinking about him, and all of a sudden, I read like literally ten minutes later saw that Conan had said that. I don't know how true that is, but what I've enjoyed about the minis wrestling is that they're treating it like a real match. You know, it's not um, going under the referee's leg, stomping on people's hands and feet, biting them in the ass. Okay. Uh, you, you know, they're treating it like a real match. And with that being said, it's been very refreshing to listen to the commentary the last couple of weeks without them bickering back and forth. Um, I think the dynamic of the three of them has actually been very good. I've enjoyed the commentary quite a bit, but at no point did they treat these guys like comedy characters. And so when they had this match, you know, it was, it was seamless. It was okay. They both got a mini, but they, at no point were they acting like it was a big disadvantage if one of them were in the ring. Right. You know, and they didn't have to, uh, tag out. Like I remember like one of the old WrestleManias, it was like Hillbilly Jim and two midgets against King Kong Bundy and two midgets, you know, and, and it was like <laughs> the midgets were only able to wrestle against each other. Obviously those two guys were beasts of human beings, but um, it was just kind of nice to say, you know, Hey, whoever's in the ring is, is in the ring. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, um, I mean, I enjoyed the match. I thought everyone in the match was so talented that, you know, I, th- I thought for what it was, it was, uh, it was pretty good. Um, yeah, so I mean like for, for me, I, I'm a big fan of uh of, of Garza Jr. Um Garza Jr. I, I don't know why they're not doing more with him. Is he like just a he is he like just, just a loner from uh from AAA or from Crash or whatever? Like is he like just only like, do they not have uh, long-term plans for him because he is awesome. Like, you know, that dude is so good. Uh, the tag team of him and Laredo Kid, they never disappoint. They have not had a dud match yet, right? Um, when 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 we first started this whole uh, Jarrett experiment, right, the Jarrett era, when this first all began, uh, they were really pushing Reno Scum. And I'm not going to lie, wasn't much of a fan, right? Oh. But but uh, we, we, we can definitely debate <laughs> we, we can debate that if you want to. But I tell you who did stand out and who has always stood out every single time they're on TV, Garza Jr. and Laredo Kid. I love the thing that Garza Jr. does where he'll, he'll go, stop, and then he tears away the pants. And it's like, you can all, it gets all the girls in the crowd, like they always scream. And these guys are excellent wrestlers too, man. So I'm just, I'm a big fan of Garza Jr. Like, I don't know why they don't do more with this guy because he's dope. And like, even if, um, like, it's tough to just keep putting them against LAX, keep putting them against LAX over and over and over again. Um, but they're really good and they deserve to be featured. So, uh, you know, anytime you can get these guys on the show, it's always a plus. I like what you pointed out about the minis, how they're not treating them as, <clears throat> as a novelty. And, that was probably, um, if, if, if I had any hesitation about the minis, it's probably just that, just because I'm so used to seeing them through the, the prism of WWE in which they are a novelty, right? They're doing things like biting the ref on the butt and stomping on people's hands and all this other stuff, right? Like it just, just accentuating the fact that they're little people, but these guys, they're just out there wrestling. Um, and by the way, I feel like Damos is about the same size as Rockstar Spud. So just, yeah, there's not a, <laughs> there's not a huge difference. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I mean, this match was good. Trevor Lee wrestling with the bell is absolutely hilarious. It is. Um, but you know, to your point with, uh, Garza jr. Yeah. He's a star. Um, they're just lacking heel tag teams at the moment. And, you know, when he's getting fed to LAX, you know, that, you know, it does kind of suck. Um, with Reno Scum, I'm a big Reno Scum fan, but I think it might have been uh, creatively uh, kind of bailed them out that uh, Adam Thorne still got hurt because they were being forced just a little bit when they were getting clean wins over Decay and all that. Like people were people were getting upset. And they were going to get the Roman Reigns treatment fast, you know. So I think I think it was good to take them off for a little bit. But they do need some heel teams. Uh, I've said it on the show before. 
Hakeem Zane, who who is tagged up with Idris Abraham on Impact. He's not a official member of the company yet. I've I've spoken to him a couple times, and he's he is hoping it's going that direction because Jared is a fan of them as a team. He was supposed to be at this set of tapings, but they logistically couldn't work it out. So I think he was probably scheduled to be Trevor Lee's in, uh, Trevor Lee's spot in this match because um, Trevor Lee's inclusion was a little random since he's uh, beefing with Sanjay, and you know his inclusion in that match was a little bit random. But um, but yeah, the good guys win this one, and. I thought it was fun personally. Uh, Joseph Park then hypes up Grado because he's got a date with LVN. He uh, ate the chocolates, lost the champ- champagne, but he had coupons. <laughs> what those coupons were for, who knows? Uh, but they go di- have dinner at this pancake house, and they're the only people there. Grado is in his wrestling gear. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, I find Laurel's character absolutely hilarious. Um, she's like, I like it hot. And she's pouring that pepper in, in her mouth. I mean, she had that stack of like seven burgers. Yeah. Oh, dude. I, I hope that I hope that they find something really good with Laurel long term. I, I listened to an interview with her before Slammiversary. The interview interviewees were absolutely terrible but she yeah. was she was great she was a great uh i mean interviewers were terrible but as an interviewee she was really good but i really got that vibe in the interview that she's there because she's not in wwe mm-hmm. you know there's certain people you get the the vibe like they're they're happy to be there and she didn't put them down or anything like that that's not where i'm going with it but it was the interview was so wwe centric and about tough right. enough and everything and she said she you know maybe i could be one of those girls on nxt having those crazy matches so yeah i feel like um she's in the plans of the company i just i wasn't convinced that she that the company's in her plans necessarily mm. so right. especially with her boyfriend being a part of that company so yeah. you know hopefully she sticks around cuz but this character is uh, she's continued to add layers to it, and it's it's uh, pretty funny. Yeah, um, no, hundred percent. I think um, I think they they stumbled onto something here with this character, and I feel like this character has really is going to end up being like the cocoon for Laurel Van Ness to become a star. Um, she's oh my god, man, she has done such a fantastic role, a job with this role, like. I laugh out loud watching it, right? I love the segment where they were in the ring last week and, uh, you know, Grado was trying to trying to kick it to her. And uh, he was, like, talking about how, how much her, her makeup looked nice and how pretty her teeth are. And she was just playing along with everything, man, everything. And her facial expressions were good. And, um, and the, the crowd started chanting Netflix and chill. And... I always say this, and this is probably my biggest, uh, um, my, 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 my biggest check mark uh, for Allie, right? Is that she tends to get a reaction out of that impact zone crowd all of the time. And that is no small feat, right? You've been there plenty of times, and I'm sure you know most of the people there are not there to watch wrestling, right? Like, a lot of people there are just like park goers, right? I, and so, I, there's not as many park goers as people think. No, no, it, it's a lot. It, well, well, whatever it is, man, a lot of those people be sitting on their hands during those shows. Maybe it's the long tapings. But no matter what it is, it seems to be hard to get a a good, genuine reaction out of those crowds. And um, and so, so. When 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 Ali does it, that's impressive. When El Patron does it, that's impressive. And when I'm watching this segment here with Grado and Laurel Van Ness, and they're getting good reaction out of this crowd, I'm like, yo, you're on to something here, right? This is this is really good. And even in the pre tapes, like with this date segment, you know, she just does a really great job as coming off as gross. <laughs> and um, yeah. and uh, yeah, man. So I think this character is great for her, and she's doing a great job with it. Yeah. With, with regarding the fans, my opinion. I mean, at the times I've been there, I did not feel like it was there was many um, tourists. Other Impact Zone goers I've talked to also agree. There are some there, but uh, I think the 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 crowd is a little too spaced out. I I just think if it was a tighter crowd, like in an indie crowd where it's kind of all the way around the ring, even if it's four rows deep, kind of like Ring of Honor does it. Right, because they, they leave the hard camera side completely empty, right? 
Yeah. So I think if they did it that way, I think you would hear a difference because you never want to be that one guy chanting by yourself. Right. And, you know what I mean? And it's easier to do it as an, as those around you are doing it as well. And I think that's where there's a little bit of a, a disconnect, you know, my, my opinion. Uh, maybe there are more in there than I think there are, but I've never got um, – because, you know, from people watching, I never got the vibe that there was that many people in there completely clueless of what, what was going on. You know, it, you would right. see, you know, like if you see the segments of um, El Patron and people standing up doing the CCC, like you're seeing almost everybody respond. Or I'll put it like this. During this show, you're seeing every section at some point react to somebody. So uh -huh. I, I've just never felt like in there that there was just people who were completely clueless. Mm -hmm. Um not to say there aren't some in there, but, um, and then we're at the, uh, LAX clubhouse after that. And they, uh, bring in Dos Caras in there, his father. And, um, they do, uh, they do a good job of, of mixing Spanish and English, which I really appreciate because I know like with the WWE with whenever they have someone on there, like Rey Mysterio or something like they they'll have them speak Spanish, but then they'll always repeat themselves in English, like right, yeah, mi familia, my family, right, you know, right, um, right, 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 right. But like real Hispanic, I was just say real Hispanics, but in, in real life we don't we don't do that. Yeah, you know we we like especially with I'm Puerto Rican, especially us, like we mix English and Spanish, and that's just how we talk, you know. So it's like like with no change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like soy un campeón de impact wrestling, you know, right. like you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. that's just <laughs> it's like Spanish, Spanish, Spanish eggs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's kind of what Conan does, and it's a lot more believable because you still understand where he's kind of going with it. You know, it's not like uh, we need subtitles by any means, but um, then we get which was oh man, this was a lot of fun. This was Matt Seidel versus Loki versus El Hijo de Fantasma. This this was a lot of fun. This was great. I, I, man, I, I was really into this. Phantasma was was really good. He does that dive through the ropes, which is nuts, because it's like he almost like tilts his head down. It's one of his moves, I guess, his, his signature moves or whatever. But it's it's really really impressive. Uh, Matt Sydal and Loki have always, you know, they've been doing tremendous work. Loki tr cracks me up in that suit. At least now his tie is shorter because. I don't know if you saw when he uh, de re debuted. His tie was like past his testicles. Was it really? <laughs> that thing was so long. I was like, dude, there's no, that's a hazard. You're going to like step on that while you're running. Um, now it's a little, uh, little more in check, if you will. But you, you enjoy this one? Oh, man. I, yo, this match was really good. Um, the thing that really stood out about this match, right, is that this was the opposite of what I, I typically see from these multi-man X Division matches, right? There was there was good selling, there was good pace, and the finish made sense, right? Like I'm just so not a fan of spot fest and spots that don't make sense. Like even when I was a, when I was a kid and I would watch the uh, the Luchadors on Monday Nitro, the Cruiserweights or whatever. Whenever I would see a group of guys gathering outside the ring. I knew somebody was going to run and get and dive on them, right? So like, yeah. uh, just just give me stuff that makes sense. So I like wrestling that makes sense, and you got that here, right? Like, um, the Phantasma, uh, aka King Cuerno, a lot of people might know him from uh, Lucha Underground. Uh, JB actually mentioned on here that that Phantasma competes as King Cuerno on uh, on Lucha Underground, so I thought that was dope. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, like this match was good. It was like it. It had your high-flying stuff, but these guys weren't just out there to do a bunch of flips and leg slaps, right? So, like, uh, so I really enjoyed this match. This was a good match. This could have ended the show. This was really good. This Everything that did mattered. Um, it made sense. And there was, you know, when uh, when uh, Phantasma had uh, Matt Seidel on the surfboard stretch and then uh, Loki did the uh, Warriors way. Yeah, that was dope, man. Yeah. That, was, that spot was dope. And then, of course, the uh, the finish where Seidel hit the uh, shooting star press on a uh, low key. I don't remember exactly what. I think he was going for the pin. Yeah, that was great. So this this was really good. Now, post match, I was actually really excited to hear what Matt Seidel had to say. You know, because it was like, okay, we're gonna get some storyline for the X division here, and you know. But then Lashley came out, and it kind of killed it, and it reminded us, okay, it's all about the world title here. 
I don't know why Matt Seidel got down on his knees. That's probably like yeah. the last thing you do around the destroyer. <laughs> right. um, and then he just breaks him in half. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he, he wants his title shot and uh, we're going to get, looks like another Lashley and El Patron match. So um, then we go back to Grado and LVN's date. Uh, this was kind of awkward. She was all over him trying to kiss him. And he's, he's just <laughs> yeah. thinking, I just, I just got to get my, my green card, baby. <laughs> So we'll see. I, I didn't like this this segment as much as I did the first one in the show, but you know, it was whatever. Um, and then, so Chris Adonis comes out with Eli Drake. Just so happens to have a cup of water and splashes <laughs> out on the swole mates. You oh, know, okay. um, and, and like I said, we, we're not going to let Loki, uh, not Loki, but Sanjay into the arena. But we'll let uh, the swole mates just do whatever the hell they want. Enter the ring, right, uh, with the professional athletes. This dude, he hit that clothesline on Chris Adonis, and he almost fell. <laughs> oh god! All this did was make me not want to watch Swole Mates. <laughs> but uh, so we get the main event: Eddie Edwards versus EC3 versus Eli Drake versus Moose. Now, the first thing that stood out to me here is why are we having this match? There's no stipulation. There's no. What, you know what happens for the winner? Nothing. But I, I enjoy the match. I thought it was solid. I have four guys I like very much, and Eli Drake comes out on top, which no one <clears throat> expected that. Um, he, Eddie Edwards took that one percenter like a champ. He planted his ass in the ground. Mm. Um, but Eli Drake wins. I doubt they're going to turn this into some kind of number one contender thing. Uh, I wish it was. It was kind of a quick match. It was six and a half minutes long. You know, like the previous yeah. match was longer than this. But um, so, I, so I, I know we're pressed for time here, but I did have one thing that really stood out to me about this, and the reason why I love this match. The match itself was solid, but I love the fact that Eli Drake got the win. Or E. Lie Drake. I know you guys can't see me, but I was actually doing the thing. All right. But, um, yeah. So I love the fact that Eli Drake got the win. And here's why. As I said earlier, GFW needs to do as many things as possible to distinguish itself from WWE. And the biggest and most important thing that they can do to that note is have headline stars that people do not see as WWE retreads or castoffs, okay? And so I was thinking, who are the guys who can fill that role? And I came up with three names. I came up with EC3, I came up with Moose, and I came up with Eli Drake. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it, we don't have to go into how great Eli Drake's mic skills are. Um, you know, obviously, he looks like a million bucks, and he's got great charisma. And so I'm saying, take this guy, make him your top baby face, or, you know, have him climb up, and then... You can do Eli Drake versus EC3. You can do Eli Drake versus Moose. And these guys can – I can see these three guys being your headline package for your company. And so that was um, that was kind of what I took away from the match is that Eli Drake, he has superstar written all over him, and he doesn't have WWE written all over him. And so they'd be foolish to let this guy get away. Agreed. After this, uh, Mackenzie Mitchell backstage. She's uh, she's talking to the swole mates, and <laughs> they they look like they're gonna cut, a, cut some kind of promo here. This guy doing his flexing gimmick, and then the other one starts to talk, and then immediately Conan cuts them off. Um, hilarious! They just made he just made Lex the biggest baby faces on the show with this. Uh, <laughs> absolutely hilarious i watched that like the little gif gif over what i don't even know how you say that so many times where he's like you know the 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 big dude starts oh you know we're not here for it and then all of a sudden you come come document this right uh, absolutely <laughs> hilarious uh I'm, I'm a little a little pressed on time here uh but you know basically just just to wrap it up you know they wanted el patron to join he has said he was going to in order to protect his family put on the lax shirt ends up turning on him I actually think this whole um, this whole thing is pretty. Uh, I, th I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm locked into this storyline uh, 100%. Like it's a reason I turned the TV on, but I'm intrigued with it. It gives that LEX something to do, so they don't have to continue to wrestle because you know it gives them some longevity with the titles. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about it? 
Um, no, I, I think you're right. Um, and listen, it's okay as a Latino brother, it's okay to feel uh, proud and happy that they're featuring a Latino centric storyline and that they're not being, you know, stereotypical with it. Because let's be honest, wrestling often traffics in stereotypes. And as I hate the term minorities, but as non white people, it's tough to not be offended sometimes or have to swallow your slight offendedness at the fact that wrestling always traffics in stereotypes. So I like the fact that LAX is being featured as top villains. El Patron is being featured as a top hero. And the mindset here, make no mistake about it, is that they're going to fill the arenas with Latino people when they decide to go back on tour. And I have no problem with that. They're, we're here and we have money. I'm not Latino, but I'm just saying we as brown people, we're here and we have money. All the future stars don't have to be, they, they don't have to be white people for us. You know what I mean? So that that's okay. And I'm not shying away from that point at all. It's a thing. This was a very Latino night. Um, Drago, Sammy Guevara, Laredo Kid, Garza, Octagoncito, Demus, Loki, El Hijo de, Hijo de Fantasma, and El Patron and LAX. It's a so. great demographic, right? Like, you know, the people come out, they support. The, one of the livest moments from Slammiversary was when LAX came out. I love seeing those Mexican flags waving in the crowd, and those Puerto Rican flags waving, waving in the crowd. Like, that's dope to me. Like, you know what I mean? That's people coming out saying, I identify with you. And that's that's I, I like it. So for me, it brings real energy to the crowd, to the arena, to the show. And I'm all for it. And, you know, to Jeff Jarrett's credit, that's what he's going for here. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Um, the, the, the story itself, the way the segment played out, I really liked it. They had me on the edge of my seat thinking Patron. As I'm watching this, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so we're going to get Patron as a heel for a couple of weeks. And then he's going to break away. You know, how is this going to play out? I was convinced he was going to join, and then he whooped everybody's ass. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was good stuff. So I'm a fan. I like the way it played out. Yep, can't wait to see what's next with these guys. So um, that's going to do it for the King of the Mountain podcast this week. Thanks to Terrence for sliding through, and uh, we will talk to you guys next time. Peace.